Hello and welcome to this introductory episode of Cinecraze. My name's Nathan, and as you probably already guessed, I'm obsessed with movies. I love talking about them, and what I hope to create here is a fun forum of film discussion with friends, influences, acquaintances, whomever. Today's guest showed up on my radar when I was a kid back in 1983 going to the opening weekend premiere of Jaws 3D. I'm speaking, of course, of the actor who portrayed Sean Brody in that film, Mr. John Putch. Little did I know then that this cat would show up in so many things that I would naturally gravitate towards, being in film or television exploitation films, independent films, mainstream films, mainstream television, actor, writer, director, producer. John Putch has done it all. Before we get into the interview, I'm going to show you a trailer to one of his more recent efforts, a passion project, something he's very proud of, entitled The Father and the Bear, a film that he self-financed and self-distributed. Enjoy. One of the greatest actors I ever saw worked at that theater. Nothing compares with seeing a great play. The performance you see will never occur again. Lives only in your imagination. Can you tell me about Byron Temple? Best damn actor I ever saw. He could make you laugh till your sides split or cry like a baby depending on which play he was in. Welcome to the Palace of Fine Art. Thank you. This is Sarah, the general manager. Nice to meet you. And our fearless costume designer, Storch. Hi, Mrs. Harv. I should get back in the game. This retirement thing is boring the hell out of me. I need stuff to do besides rake leaves. How come you sit outside the theater all the time? Well, it's not my home anymore, I guess. I don't want to disturb anyone. Byron, I got a bit of an issue. I don't have anyone to play Horace Bridgewater. Do you think you could help me out? I just wanted to say that was really great. Thank you, my dear. I, I thought you did very well, too. Dad, where were you all day? I called you a million times. Oh, I was over at the pole doing a show. What if you can't remember your lines? About five years ago, I was at a matinee, and something went wrong. We're worried, Bill. We wondered if you have an alternate plan. But he wants to be here. It's obvious. You are aware of what happened last time he was on stage here, right? He paused a really long time, like he was lost or something. Then he walked off the stage. Curtain came down, they sent us all home. Why can't he just hold his script and then look at it when he needs to? Not a chance. He'll never go for it, he's too proud. We just need to figure out a way to get him through. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your places call. Places please for act one. Nice to hear an audience out there again, huh? Sure. Byron, I got a show to do now. You hear? For someone you never heard of, he became a star in these parts. Well, the town's all abuzz about the return of Byron Temple. People used to call the theater to make sure he was going to be in the plays before they would buy their tickets. I can't remember my first line. Is he just rusty, or is there something else going on? Okay. <laughs> Father and the Bear. Uh, what I really, really enjoyed about it um, was the fact that you incorporated your father, your mother, and your sister as characters within the piece. I mean, they're, they're themselves in the film footage or in the posters or any of that stuff, but now mm -hmm. they're, and yourself too. You're the guy on the oh, phone yeah. talking That's about right. that NBC miniseries shot in South <laughs> Africa, Poseidon Adventure. You know, it was it was terrific, yeah. and I just loved how that was like just a love letter not only to the totem pole but your your heritage within the theater and your and the town and everything about it. It was so, and on top of it, Robert Picardo shows up. I'm like, what? Uh, I didn't even know he was in it. 
you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. so you just watched it recently then? Is that why no, you're, you're I watched you're it thinking of it now? Or? A couple of months ago, but I went okay. back and I watched the commentary, which is amazing. Mm. Yeah, and but good info in that. there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You couldn't yeah. do that with a studio picture. They wouldn't allow you to do no. that. Such a great custom commentary track well i made it i I made i made the dvd i made the movie i did i controlled the artwork i did everything that box you showed me is everything from me so it is a home movie and it is true you you i wouldn't i mean yeah i made my commentary track i wanted to have interactive shit going on you know i wanted to cut to pictures of people as i talked about them and you know that was fun that was really fun and you know as a leave behind because basically i'm at a point in my life where when I make something of my own, like these movies, the Route 30 and this, um, I, I'm thinking about what I'm leaving behind. And if anyone uncovers it, you know, what would I want to know? Or, you know, when it, not the usual shit. Oh, this actor was funny. You know, all that yeah. stuff that we're normally shoveled. You know, I want, you know, when I listen to old commentary, I'm, I'm always interested in the, what the filmmaker says more than I am what the actors say. And uh, only because, and if that filmmaker happens to be not full of shit, you know, and is honest, then there's some really fascinating things you could learn. And uh, so, yeah, I just kind of made it as like a leave behind and and filled in the, you know, talked about the the trivia and the tidbits and all the intersecting things that, you know, go into my movies and you know, it's. I'm glad you you saw it and you 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 clocked a lot of it. I mean, you're connecting more dots than most people do. I mean, I my family doesn't even connect dots like you have in these films. Really, so, good job. Yeah, you're awesome. you're a true aficionado. You're a true film person. You know, I'm a fish of some sort. I don't know. Yeah, you're a fish. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But uh, yeah, no, I loved it because it was like a you're giving us like the scrapbook or the uh, template for the entire movie. And cause I, as I'm watching it, I went back and watched certain scenes too. And Mm -hmm. I'm sitting there thinking like when you show like the names on the wall, there's your name, your sister and Mm -hmm. I believe Gene Stapleton's on there as well. And just, Mm -hmm. and and stuff like that. I think I'm catching it. And I go to turn on the commentary later on and I go, Oh my goodness all the stuff is there and it's real yeah yeah and i love that because in the footage of the the prior productions at the at the playhouse back way back and when you Mm -hmm. pinpoint what actors yourself in there or Mm -hmm. and what production what year it's very immersive and i can only imagine being a patron of the totem pole having such reverence for the product that you delivered and they can probably and they've gone there season after season and watched so many productions yep that it's a it's a home movie for them too yeah the unfortunately most of them are so old i mean the older geezers really uh connect with it and remember uh that all that footage uh See, I'm a big fan of recycling, and I guess I get this from my dad because he ran a summer stock theater where you had to reuse the sets, you know, uh, mm. every season and p- just repaint them and move moved that doorway to this side of the stage for the next uh, play and just, you know, redecorate. And uh, that's what stock summer stock is. You use the stocks that the theater owns to create the shows. Costumes, you know, you're constantly rotating costumes, props, sets, furniture. So... This was how I grew up. I grew up in this environment. So when I set out to do these, uh, my own movies, you know, that I'm paying for, they have to be the same way and they're low budget. And like when I was a kid, me and my dad took the Super 8 camera and every time we had a musical or some show, I mean, he shot a lot of stuff in the 60s on his own with his 8 millimeter camera. He was thankfully one of those guys. And then when I got to be of age and he gave me a Super 8 camera, then I started making movies. But every summer, we would I'd have a sound camera, and I would we'd go out to the back of the house and, and a show that I wasn't in, Dad would be shooting, and we'd try to shoot every musical number. And um, that's what all that footage is. And then when I wasn't in a show, I would be out there shooting every musical number. And, like, you'd get through maybe one song per 
Super 8 cartridge. So oh, yeah. it was really expensive. <laughs> I can imagine. And, yeah, but, you know, Dad, it was, it was great. It was so archival. And I've had this, this stuff since the late 70s. I've had all of this footage that was shot when I was in high school. And I first used it. And it's of the theater and the beautiful productions in the heyday. I mean, back when mom was working there, I mean, we had the money because people would come to see Gene Stapleton. She'd be in the first two plays and then the she'd go back and do all in the family and we'd stay there the rest, do the, the next four plays or five plays. And because the, her shows were always sold out, they literally uh, deficit financed anything that was not a sellout from that point on. So it, it really, it, there was money for beautiful sets. He could spend a little more on, you know, renting furniture that we didn't have or getting this incredible dancer from New York or this incredible, you know, piano player or musician or, or orchestral something. And so we'd shoot all that and that that was such a uh, uh that was the salad days of that theater was was 1970 to 19 i'd say 83 and in that time we shot these this footage and then of course years later after my father passes away you know he had such an arsenal of of stuff of of photos and records and and numbers i mean he had he had a bible of every uh uh, play from 1954 to 1983 and how many people saw it, what the grosses were, what the, who was in every season. Who was, I mean, it was like typed in a three ring binder. I still have it. It's amazing. And, uh, uh he, uh, so after he passed, I have all these, vi this video and I have all this info of him and that's, and I, you know, wanted, so I made a documentary about him and it was called, this is my father. And it's on every one of my DVDs, um, you know, that I've made. It's part of the bonus material. And it, it's basically a history of the theater and him and uh, what went on there. And uh, I used all that footage for that movie, that doc. I mean, I relied heavily on that footage. And so that was a great use for it. I've also uploaded it to its own Vimeo page, uh, Totem Pole Video. Um, but then, I, you know... I didn't use any of it in Route 30 because it had nothing to do with it. But like all of a sudden, the father and the bear idea comes up about a guy who worked in a summer theater and he has dementia and he wants to get on stage one more time. And, you know, we're, I wanted, you know, obviously I wanted to use Totem Pole before it slipped out of my grasp because I don't know what's going to happen to it. Or if someone will, the new guy who comes in and says, no, you can't come here anymore, John, and shoot your movies, you know. That's true. Yeah. So... I said, I got to do something with the theater before I don't get in there anymore. And uh, that's when I came up with the idea of the, the, you know, shooting the story there and using actors that had appeared at the theater in the film. And then to, to get to your point, I, uh, the history of the theater is dramatized in, in the, in the movie, you know, the, the, the faces on the green room wall are really there, and those are the, the those are all the people that were appeared in 25 plays or greater at the time. And our lead character, Will Love, who played Byron Temple, he's up one of the top. He's 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 number one now because he's he was there for 25 years after you know my father or the Putches were gone, but. So I changed his name to Byron Temple on the on the thing. It's up there. It's not Will Love. It's the character of the movie now. Yeah. And David Deloise goes in and looks at the, you know, at the wall. And it, yeah, and it's still there. I mean, they did a Facebook post about it recently, just to, you know, just for uh, nostalgia. Posterity. And uh, yeah, yeah st still there. And um, wow. you know the 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 the, uh, the all the things that about it. Everything he said basically was stuff that. You know, you make you you make the best friends of your life in the theater. That's that's talked about. That came from the documentary from somebody who mentioned it in the documentary. The uh, the someone mentioned once uh, the smell of the theater. It never changes. You walk in that auditorium, it has the same smell ever. So I wanted to have Byron, you know, step into the door because he hasn't been in there in five years and like take a deep breath to smell it in. Not many people get that, but things like that. 
So everything, everything about it kind of is real. Waiting backstage to go on before your yes. entrance. Fascinating looking set behind the set. And that's authentic. Those are real sets. Those weren't like Hollywood sets. And there was theatrical lights. And he stood behind his door and you know opened it and went out. And, you know, it just really authentic. And it was really easy to do because that's interesting to me. And I never see it in movies. So... That's true. I try the best I can to come up with things in my movies that may not be so commonplace. And it's really hard, as you know, because you know, you've it's watched and done. seen everything. Everything's yeah. been done. Yeah. And what very few movies take taking place in a summer stock theater have been done. I know there's like, I can count three. And then I'm sure, and then way back into the 50s, there might have been some when it was very popular, but it's not a subject that, you know, you see very often. So I like that. I like that about it because it made me feel like, okay, I'm, I'm going to leave behind something that's a, at least a little less pedestrian, you know, than, than we're used to seeing. And that's the hardest part of coming up with a movie is like, for me because i'm very hard on on everything i watch i go oh my god i'm gonna see this again you know this yeah. storyline really i'm seeing that again yeah Been nobody is that. saying you can't do that but i guess we've lived long enough to see everything have we haven't we well the classics you know and i mean everyone steals too whether they know it or not oh you know, yeah not always intentional it's just you know in your mind and you don't think about it but but yeah. like you said you're immersing the viewer into that experience the sight and the sounds and the smells the atmosphere mm -hmm. um if you have someone who doesn't go to the theater this is the perfect gateway to learn not only about stage production but the life behind it Just, hopefully yeah yeah and, and so, hopefully it's you know interesting enough to keep hold their interest but i think so but, because it's uh it's sight and sounds and everything that you don't think about like you said you see productions even like john cassavetti's opening night mm -hmm. you see some of that but not to the degree certainly it's not summer stock but you know mm -hmm. it puts you in that world a little bit more so than the other films before it so kudos to you sir good job thank you well you know like i've said before when i make a movie of my own I reverse engineer it. I don't just write something out of thin air. I literally look around at my resources, see what I have at my disposal, and then write a story into what I have, what I'm capable of getting my hands on. And that's that's what all of Route 30 was, the trilogy. Every one of them was had to deal had that to and the, and then Father and the Bear obviously. I mean, where else am I going to get a summer stock theater in full operation? to allow me to come in and shoot an entire movie at right only place would be the place i grew up and that my father used to work, run and that i'm still a uh a, you know a an appreciated uh member of the of the theater there and uh trusted i guess and because that would not yeah it would yeah. it would not it wouldn't it if i wrote that script and then tried to go make it and i had no connection to a theater impossible oh, yeah. impossible they'd look at me and go are you out of your fucking mind or they'd right. say yeah well you know five thousand a day you know and it's so it's that's the reverse engineering part and that's what i tell everybody when i give little seminars or things that you know sometimes i give little micro budget seminars or whatever and that's the number one thing i say stop don't sit there and write your medical drama when you have no way on earth to get it shot otherwise you're going to spend 10 to 20 years trying to sell your movie that someone else has already made or doesn't care as much about you so like you know my example is if your uncle owns the ford dealership in town guess where your movie's going to take place you're making used you know? cars yeah yes yeah or you're you know or it's production value you know right. what can't you get what can't what can you get that somebody else can't if you have no money to pay for it, you know? So that's, for me, that's where it started. So I pretty much run the gamut in Pennsylvania in my hometown. I'm not sure what to do next there if I were to do anything at all. But I'm my super fans of Route 30 are 
clamoring for some other chapter or adventure and I just I think about doing it but I'm not certain what it could be yet and I've really exhausted mostly everything there so there's, mm -hmm. there's nothing phenomenally interesting that I can get my hands on that I, I would have to rely on my on my writing skills for once <laughs> Ah. Well, you could get uh, galactic with it again in some kind of way, maybe. Oh, believe uh, me, there'll be spaceships. Believe me. There's nothing funnier than spaceships and South Central PA. <laughs> 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 nothing better. Well, nothing there you better. go. Mm -hmm. I mean, alien invasions happen all the time. So True, and they do crack me up. So I mean, don't, don't make it forced, but yeah, if you want to make a quadrilogy go for it you know? no i would have to change it to something else i would have to call it i would just have it be a standalone movie or i wouldn't tie it to the trilogy i might use some characters but i, I would the call same it universe yeah yeah i would call it i wouldn't call it anything i can't i can't i in the opening credit song of route 33 the lyrics plainly state there will never ever ever be a route 34 <laughs> never say never again, sir. Yeah. All my uh, f fan friends, they, they say, well, just skip four and make it five then. You know, we don't care. That's interesting. There's trivia. There's the, yeah. I don't think anyone skipped a sequel. <laughs> you could jump the I know, five. I could be, I could. Confuse the shit there, that's, that's original, right? That's, that's Nobody's something. Nobody's done that. Nobody's done that. There's been a, like a surf two. <laughs> Without a surf one. Really? Yeah. Oh, God, that's Even funny. Surf comedy with Eddie Deason. Uh, surf two. That's funny. Early Eric Stoltz, actually. Um, yeah, they made that. And let's see. Well, there was the House movies. I don't know if you remember those from the 80s. I totally remember those. House, ding dong, you're dead. Yeah. It was one of the first taglines I laughed out loud at. Yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and the poster, it goes perfect. Yeah, yeah. There Goes the Neighborhood was another one. Uh, yeah, I think that's... But the, Ding Dong, You're Dead was the funny one. That was, I think that was the first one. Yeah, that is the original, yeah. But they made... A, <laughs> the, Sean Cunningham produced those, and then he made uh -huh. the third one overseas. Actually, it was released here as The Horror Show. I never knew it was supposed to be House 3. It has nothing to do with the other two movies. Really? And all of a sudden, out of the blue, here comes House 4. I mean, what the <laughs> fuck is... What? Where's House 3? The whole time I'd seen House 3, but I didn't realize it. Interesting. 20 years later, you figure out all this stuff, and you're like, okay, so what were they thinking, releasing a House 4? I mean, yeah. you go to the video store, it'd be House 1, 2, and 4. <laughs> Clearly, oh. the title was changed for foreign release, and no one ever released it in the States under the House 3. Yeah, I mean, it didn't. had to be. No, yeah, they, it was. Well, horror show was Lance Henriksen movie. And, uh -huh. uh, it's a fun movie, but it's it was during that era when everybody was getting electrocuted in horror films. You had Shocker, <laughs> Shocker, had Destroyer with Lyle Alzado. <laughs> oh yeah, like a theme, and oh, Slaughterhouse yeah. Rock had a little bit of that, and uh, also Prison, the Rennie Harlan movie. But um, yeah. So remember, I remember when I saw a uh, shocker, that was pretty funny. Wasn't that Wes Craven or somebody like yep. that? Yeah. And, and, uh, and then all of a sudden I start watching X-Files years later and there's, there's Mitch Pileggi. Yeah. Isn't that his name? Yep. Yeah. Mitch Please. Pileggi yeah, who yeah, played yeah. shocker. And, and yeah. uh, I was like going, that's shocker. So going, Man, <laughs> guy's yeah. playing a, you know, FBI guy. He's done quite well for himself. Uh, so yeah. uh, actually, uh, one of your actors is in that in shocker oh oh dendry dendry yes was she in it really she's in shocker oh well she's been working right out of high school we went to high school together and she she's been working out never stopped and she's also in star trek generations but not in your scene we have analyzed the romulans tricorder they were scanning for signature particles of a compound called trilithium. Right. Didn't I think I mentioned this on the last briefly, but the, the when they made that first generations movie, Junie Lowry Johnson, the casting director, wanted to take all of the guest stars that you know the that she'd had over the years on the series and 
and place them in the little small parts. Saturday at 7 on Channel 11. So there was a big, you know, please do these. I noticed it's beneath you now and all that stuff. And everybody was going, hell no, we'll do it. It's great. And that Dendry was clearly one of those chosen as well. Because I so. think she reprises her character from the series. She did like an episode oh. of the series, yeah. Right on. So, and then of course, even Tommy Hinckley. <laughs> just watching Bill Shatner sail over our heads uh, when he broke the railing and just falling on his ass right in front of us. What? Fant- oh, I didn't tell you that story? No. <laughs> Is this when he's saving the ship? Yeah. Yeah. Um <laughs> Well, that whole week on the ship, I mean, this is so random, uh, but um, yeah, he came on and it was a big, everyone was like, oh my God, it's Bill Shatner, it's Bill Shatner. And um, I had stuff to do with him because uh, I was the camera guy for the reporters that were covering the press event. Hey, Mark. Captain Kirk. Yeah. I'd be honored if you would give the order to get underway. Take us out. They're taking the Kirk. ship out around the around the moon and coming back, take pictures and all that stuff. So, and then all shit goes wrong during the flight. But, uh, yeah. So he comes to do his like five days or whatever, and and uh, Jimmy Dewan's there and Walter Koenig's there, and those two were great. And Shatner would not talk to me, even though I had I literally I had dialogue with him. And I had stuff to do with him, and he he literally would just like look past me and talk to the director in front of me during our scene, like I was an extra or something. And I think he thought you were. I mean, you do. He probably he probably did think I was, but I literally had dialogue with him, so I don't know what he was thinking. And I would, uh, and the director David Carson was very. You know, he was great to me and everything, and he was including me in the conversation and. Like there's a there's a moment where he he like says get get out of my face you know with that camera you know he like shoves he pushes me away. Well, we did the we did the first take and he's he he throws me into a a light. I mean, there's like a a, a baby stand behind me and a and a small light on it. You know, a, an old Mole Richardson light and and it's literally he like shoves me and I'm, and we're up on the top of the where the captain's chair is so there's it's a platform you know with a couple steps down and so like i stumble back knock a light over and almost go down and i li- I literally got up and i go bill what this the deal you know you know and he 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 just looked away and i walked i went i marched right back up to him and i said bill let me do the fall part. Let me just just put your hand on me and make the motion. I'll do the rest, okay? There's no need for you to. And he literally just would look past me to the uh, oh, wow. uh, director David Carson and say and say, um, "I think we could do that again." <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> this this went on, and <laughs> and I, I think I did say to him, "You know, I'm an actor here. I'm not an extra." I think I said that to him, but wow. there was some I don't know what it was. Anyway. He was terrified of me or whatever. So anyway, later in the sequence, uh, he's me and Tommy are sitting. <clears throat> Tommy's the guy with the microphone, I think. He's doing recording the sound. I'm the guy with the camera. We're the, the couple of reporter guys. And we were together the whole time. Uh, so... We're down sitting in the inner ring on the floor level, and then the upper ring where the you know where the uh, railing always was uh, on the circular bridge yeah. of the Enterprise. Yeah. You know that'd be where where whenever the ship would get hit with a, a torpedo, they'd all grab, you know, and go ah, ah, you know. So there was a there was a moment like that in in this scene, and they built they made the set hydraulic. They had literally hydraulic lifts to like make the ship cant and stuff. When on the show originally, you know, they just dutch the camera, and everybody would go Arr! like that, which I used to great effect in the Poseidon Adventure. I mean, we didn't have any any 
hydraulic set. Yeah, you showed me that footage. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, we had one hamster wheel that we built two sets in to get like two two shots out of, but the rest, ballroom, Dutch camera, everybody goes like that. So anyway, this is what we have to do. So behind us is Shatner. So he's right up above our heads. Tom and I are sitting here. He's like right here. Tommy's right here. And... Uh, you know, they go three, two, one, and we all rock, you know, and then, you know, oh, let's, okay, let's do it again. Three, two, one, rock. And he's behind us doing his Shatner business that he always does. Well, the railing breaks free and we look, you know, you look up and there's Shatner flying over our heads, like down to the middle of the thing. And he, and he hit Tommy's head with his foot. He kicked Tommy in the head on the way down. And that's, that's a Tommy story is funny, but so like he flies over our head and like lands in the, you know, right in the center of the set and everybody is, everybody goes, oh, like, you know, the president has fallen or something, you know, and by the way, no one would do that today, but, um, so he gets up, I'm okay, I'm okay. And then they spent like three hours chaining, safety chaining, screwing, fixing, you know, bringing him cold beverages and making a fuss over them and and we're just sitting there going really just get up and do it again you know you're not hurt come on so that was the uh shatner flying over our head story in star trek generations <laughs> they probably are all shitting themselves here's the big talent yeah oh we, sure we yeah killed him yeah for real not just uh captain kirk right william shatner's dead you know right on our dime yeah so <laughs> that's crazy <laughs> i love how you and tommy like tommy has like the the microphone which is like an adapted phaser that's mm -hmm. what it looks like and then you've got and as i got the man you're like dumb most this. dumbass thing strapped to my head i've ever seen and then uh, and then when i did the generations tv show i played the benzite yeah. and i had this tray of gr uh, uh, ice crystals that i had to like puff into while i was talking and it was like I was like uh, there was always some gadget you know attached to me, and I couldn't I couldn't just do the scene, but yeah, Tom. And you know, Tommy and I were uh, we we played basketball together. We were friends. we growing you know going up, men coming up through time, and we did men at work together. Uh, you know, first, and then uh, you know, coincidentally, we had both been on. Um, star trek generations and we got you know cast in these two parts i mean we were laughing the whole way through that we we got to spend all this time as you know as sidekicks you know twice in movie history which i yeah. think is pretty pretty fun a word of warning my garbage toting friends from your friendly neighborhood peace officer i've got my eye on you both if you're not breaking the law now, the smart money says that it's only a matter of time before you will. And you can bet that last dollar that my ass is going to be there to make the bus. Golf clap? Golf clap. The men at work thing was just loads of fun because Tommy had, he's a smart guy. He had a, he had a speaking role, but he chose not to he do has any some lines at the end. He does. Okay. But with, most, with, yeah. Yeah. Most of, oh, most of the, uh, yeah. When we're chained to the merry-go-round, he's yeah, he's, we're screaming, but, um, he told Emilio, he says there were, he had lines in every scene. He goes, I'm not, I'm going to be this guy. I'm just going to like stink eye everybody. Mustache. Yeah, with yeah, his mustache. Yeah. He says, I'm not going to say a word. And it was hilarious. It was it, hilarious. It's great. Yeah. And yeah. the whole sequence when <laughs> Keith David tells him to drop his gun and he drops the flashlight, <laughs> then you look over, you're like, come on, dude. <laughs> Will the officer to the rear of the truck kindly drop his revolver as well? <laughs> you know... You cops must really think I'm as dumb as you look. Now, don't you know that when a flashlight hits the cement, it makes a completely different sound than a revolver? 
Let's be good boys and do exactly as I say. Okay, now, I want Mr. Sneaky Man to come around and join his partner, Mr. Bonehead. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Keith David, that guy is so... He was so funny. He used to... Uh, he would walk around the set singing uh, Rodgers and Hammerstein songs. Wow. I mean, yeah, you know, big booming Doing voice. He just like, yeah, he'd do Oklahoma. And then he also would recite paragraphs from Macbeth. And he he was just a, a riot, that guy. And uh, we all, all, when we were doing the auditions for those parts, we were all reading for the other two garbage men, Cameron and Jeff Blake, I believe, were the, okay. ended up being the two guys. But we were constantly being traded and uh, partnered up with each other. I, I was partnered with uh, Jeff Blake for, for like one sequence, and I really thought I would be getting one of those guys. And then... You know, when they, and it all came down, and he says, no, you and Tommy are the cops, and, you know, you you guys are the blah. And I was really glad, because I think I, I love that character, and I had a lot of fun with it. Uh, and there was nothing, you could not be too large for Emilio. He he said, he, he just, the bigger I got, the more he laughed. So I was just, I became the cartoon character. Oh, yeah. You guys, you're having, it, it's... It's uh, <laughs> contagious because you can tell you're having a great time. And usually that's not the case on comedies in production. Generally yeah. Kind of serious tone, but this one. Oh, yeah. And when you guys park your bikes and they both fucking fall over. I mean, it's, it's hilarious. It's like it's perfect beat for beat. That was my bit. Cops kind of thing, you know. Well, well, another fine day in the dumps, eh, fellas? Yeah, that was my bit. Uh, the uh, it'd be really funny if we walk up and all of a sudden the bikes fall over. And Emilio said, "I fucking love that." And he got the prop guy over and and they put fishing line on the bikes, <laughs> and and it worked. It was a huge. It was. I thought it was funny. There was some other bit. Oh, the hand signals. That was my bit too. Oh yeah, but, uh, I love that. on the bikes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you're making the turn. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so badasses. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was fun. That was, you know, that was that was the '80s, I believe, wasn't it? Yeah, I think that we was. We would the have 80s. shot it in '89. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It released yeah. in '90. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was, full, full scale actor at that point. I was only making short films at at the time, so I was, I did pretty good in the '80s as an actor, and then it, you know, tapered off in the '90s. But well, you kind of went. You moved to the did director. You always want to be a director first, or I mean, really, you're a storyteller no matter what. But what was your passion, being an actor? Well, I really thought I would be because I had acted at the theater. I liked performing. I, I was getting good, you know, uh, feedback for it. And then when I broke into television out there, it seemed to be a really good uh, vocation. Um, I used all the money to make movies, though, all along. So I was I was always making Super 8s all through high school. And then once I got started working as an actor, I started making 16 millimeters. And they cost more. And so I was continually making films um, while I was an actor. But I guess I had an idea that I would like to direct uh, television, at least, if not movies. Uh and and eventually I, I you know I did that's how I, I got in. I was just saying if that goes back to the totem pole days where you're archiving performances, did you catch the bug for I'm going to make my own movies as a kid? No, well the bug my father uh, uh, provided the bug because when we were very young and there was no internet or cable television in South Central Pennsylvania we would he would make um eight millimeter films and for us and star us in them like we would he would make a a, a vampire story and like i you know i i answer the door and my sister's the vampire and 
I invite her in, you know, and then, you know, I get, I, yeah, I get bit and I get turned, turned into the creature of the black lagoon. Anyway, he would, would, uh, make a soundtrack on a cassette tape and then he would play them for us, you know, when he finished with the project as entertainment for us. And we adored that. Oh, I so mean, we, were, we adored it. And, uh, he also introduced us to marionettes and puppets cause he used to do that when he was a kid. So he built us a puppet theater wrote a you know performed a puppet show for us with soundtrack and music and then handed it over to us and say okay this is do this now this is your play you guys do it so we 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 love doing that but the movie thing was what really bit me and uh then at, at i guess i was in fourth grade or fifth grade i went to some progressive school in santa monica california and they actually had a filmmaking class on fridays you had elective day was friday and you didn't do any school shit all you did was your electives and i i had filmmaking some kids had pottery some kids had art some kids had whatever so i had filmmaking so i me and a bunch of kids including matt Sachs, who was uh, b arthur's son uh, we wow. we were in the filmmaking class and we had our cameras and that our parents gave us and we would go around and shoot movies around the campus of the school all day and you know similar things would happen and that's where I learned how to edit edit a, a super eight film. I think the first real movie I made from end to end that wasn't just dumb little clips of things was uh, a claymation film and uh, where you stop motion and you bend the clay and mold the clay and move it across. And um, I think I made, I made that when I was in uh, grade school. My relationship with John as a film director began at a very young age. I think we both were in junior high school. John even might have been in grade school. And we would uh, take the camera over to Century City and uh, we had guns and uh, we ran around the Century City Mall. We were chasing bad guys, and we came up the escalator, and over the, over the loudspeaker we heard, please stop, please come to the information desk, or something like that, and, and security was kicking us out of the Century City Mall. So that was the beginning of John as the renegade filmmaker. Then, like, I don't know, junior high, after, after grade school, uh, Dad actually gave me a really nice camera, and he said, here, you, you should be out on the weekend making movies with your friends, because I was in the drama class now. So I, I, that's what happened, and that's how I started making these epic Super 8 comedies with my friend Mike and Bo and Jonathan. There was a time in... Uh junior high and high school when every weekend was spent uh, making a Super 8 movie. And me and Jonathan and Mike and Bo and all our friends, uh, we would uh, make Super 8 movies. And we loved dressing up and spoofing characters we loved on television or in films. We did long, epic films with hospital sequences and operating room shenanigans and uh, we, we had special effects back in those days that were very crude and hilarious. We had double exposures, we had motorcycles and cars and you know we would we would uh, borrow anything we could to make our productions look big. And once sound came along we had to start writing scripts with dialogue that was funny as well as the visuals. We had great fun writing uh, comedy sketches to shoot and somehow piece them all together. Culminating in the largest film we did in high school was a, a, a triple movie feature, Super 8, and uh, it had three components in it. It had, it had a Star Wars spoof in it uh, where we dressed up and played Star Wars characters. I remember uh, we'd, we'd build cockpits and sit in them and pretend to fly. I remember hand painting the um, individual 8mm frames with red paint to simulate laser fire in, uh, in, a, in a laser gun battle. The movie also had a, uh, a Dirty Harry component because Mike and I loved Clint Eastwood and the Dirty Harry movies, so we, we spoofed that. It also had a, uh, a Batman spoof 
which uh, we uh, dressed up in tights and Batman and Robin outfit and taped poster board on the side of Mike's mother's Pontiac Firebird and drove around Mulholland Drive shooting uh, funny stuff. And of course, we pretended there was a warehouse with a big fight scene against the Joker. Uh, yeah, that's where the filmmaking bug came, and I, I just love the mechanics of it. And uh, to this day, I love editing. I just, I, you know, I, I, and I edit motorcycle videos now uh, because I don't have anything narrative to do. Like, I make these comedy videos with a friend in Virginia, and we take these rides, and we shoot a bunch of gags on these rides, and we kind of spoof adventure bike, you know, uh, videos on YouTube. And... Uh, love love making those but the, the editing process is great i like i like the mechanics i like capturing the, the shot i like coming up with a bit i like editing i sit there and go i need some graphics here and i like bring in titles and you know I, that part's fun it's like like earlier like I said it's like scrapbooking so i kind of get i still enjoy that so i hope to be able to continue that part of it you know going back over some of your your films and i'm trying to think is this the first feature film that you directed alone in the woods that's credited as your first it is okay it is yes it is 1994 or something yeah yeah okay that was an andrew stevens movie yeah uh for Royal corman Oaks. for roger corman yeah, yeah that was my one yeah. roger corman experience because andrew was making um uh, what do you call it when you make it? You're you're making a movie. He was subcontracted to make some of Corman's movies, and he he did a bunch for Roger. Oh, and yeah. uh, you know that the kids' movies were big always. So yeah, that's yeah. And I met Andrew on the basketball court through Larry Poindexter, actor Larry Poindexter, who's been around forever. Yeah, uh, old friend. And uh, well, we he worked with you before too. Uh huh. Right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And Larry. Uh, and Larry, of course, if he were here, would say, "But not enough." That's what Larry would say. <laughs> He'd go, "John, I don't, I don't believe I've been in enough of your movies." Phone's not been ringing. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, so I met him on the basketball court, and I had made my third short film called "The Walter Ego," which was a black and white, dark comedy that was written by the great Scott Frank, uh, who's written major motion pictures. Uh, including Little Man Tate, and his series is, is on right, right now, Queen's Gambit. You know, that's his. Oh, okay. And okay. Uh, and there, and there Get Shorty, is, he wrote. And, uh, you know, he's, anyway, big shot. Anyway, early in his career, I, he, I had met him through a friend and read that script and thought it was really hilarious. Anyway, so I'd made the Walter Ego, and I approached Andrew on the basketball court, and Larry says, Andrew? This is John Putch. He he's a filmmaker. Uh, John, this is Andrew. He makes movies. And I go, you know, I, I had balls on me that day, or I was really, you know, I I had confidence. I go, really? I said, let me send you a movie. I I make I I can direct for you. And so he, you know, I'm sure he watched maybe five minutes, Andrew, uh, because that's his attention span. He'd tell you this story too. <laughs> He'd, he'd make some funny story about it. anyway um and uh, and he says and he hired me to do alone in the woods and all he cared about he says can you do it in 12 days and i went you know gulp i went a feature okay yeah and that was that was the start of it and if you didn't do it in 12 days you know at that point i'm t how old am i i'm like in my 20s at that point that's what it was and i did it and my wife julie produced it and uh we had Andrew's uh, assistant at the time or executive in charge of production overseeing us. So the three of us kind of made the movie and Julie really like put all the people together. And I met some uh, people on that movie that I still am friends with today and including my costume designer, Bonnie Stout, who did all the Route 30s and all the Father oh. and the Bears and, uh, and other things that we've done in the Andrew era. But yeah, that was that was the first. Uh, that was fun. We had some laughs. I got to do some Three Stooges stuff. It was shot on thirty-five. Frank Johnson, the DP from uh, Walker, Texas Ranger, was the DP. Andrew talked him into doing it, which is a, a gift because 
there, if there's anybody that could shoot fast and furious, it'd be, you know, a TV guy. Yeah. So Frank was great. He brought his camera assistant and, uh, you know, we, we knocked that thing out. It's a good one. It's a good yeah. one. David love... Lawrence did the music. He went on to do um, uh, fame. His, he went on to, to greater fame in the American Pie series of movies. He was the original composer Did he score for your that. movie? Yeah, he scored uh, Alone in the okay. Woods. And he, he actually Some... scored my American Pie yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay. I suggested, hey, let's get David to come back and do it. And he did. Yeah, so. well, that was also Mike Elliott was involved in that. Yeah, but. There. Yeah. 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 yeah, I never met Mike till I got to Universal with the Pie movie. That was the first time I met him. Heard about him all along, but we know a lot of the same people. So he 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 had a parallel existence. I was over in the Andrew camp, making movies, thankfully, and uh, he was over in the real Corman camp making. I mean, he was down on at that campus we doing tons movies. Of his movies. Yeah, I think yeah. he was the main guy in charge of a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. So what was it like working with Matthias Hughes? I, think I he love did that a pretty guy. Pretty damn great performance. He was performance. Hel- he was hilarious, and he was one of Andrew's action heroes. You know, in the Corman movies. I loved him in uh, I Come in Peace, one of my favorite Dolph Lundgren movies, and uh, No Retreat, No Surrender Two. Matthias was apparently was sellable in Germany for Andrew at the time, probably because of those movies you just mentioned. Oh yeah, and uh, so. He came on. He came on as the. He was the sweetest guy ever, and him and Chick, together, were hilarious. And uh, I, you know, I don't know what to say except it's take this big guy who was cut, give him. Just, Lenny and Squiggy dialogue or whatever, and you've got you know just hilarity i mean but yeah i thought he was great in that movie i thought he's hilarious and i didn't know i was like what is he how is he going to be comedically and he's great in it you know yeah and that's the thing about giving someone an opportunity to play against type and they yeah, i didn't know what to expect when andrew said oh and matthias hughes is in it and chicky's in it i go well that's great chicky i'll take in anything and uh because we were friends and uh yeah and I think the uh, I think yeah, and uh, Lorraine Newman was really sweet. We had a nice, yeah. got to know her. And the production designer's wife was a costumer, and she was working on a Saban series called okay. Big Bad Beetleborgs. Okay, yeah, and it, it was some of that. Yeah. yeah, and that's the Lone in the Woods movie got me the Beetleborgs job uh, to direct my first you know, non-union, you know, cheapo television, the kids show. And my training at Andrew's place with that one movie in 12 days really came in handy at, uh, you know, Beetleborgs because you had to do three episodes in nine days and that, you know, they were half hours. So they were like 20 minute episodes and they called them clusters. So we're doing cluster one, and that's episodes one, two, and three, or one, three, and five, or whatever, however they uh, doled it out. But And they were clusters, believe me. <laughs> I just had a brainstorm. With each episode, you get Japanese footage from the show in Japan, okay. and they send and and they send the costumes over, and then they write their Beetleborgs episode for American television around the stock footage plot line of what the 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 Japanese version was. So you do so you'd have to incorporate your stock footage with, you know, other. Like the stunt people would be dressed up and they'd, they'd do the, you know, this on one thing. And then you cut to wide shot stock footage and there'd be the monster next to them. And it'd be the same, a person in a, the same outfit. But okay. you had to do all the tie-in shots to make it work for your script and your story. And-
anything. It's great. It's really fun to uh, construct something with stock footage because you just can't believe what you can get away with. And um, now nowadays it'd be even easier because everything's digital. But back then you had to get the negative uh, uh, or the uh, work print, not the work print, the, uh, the dupe negative from the studio you were buying the footage from. And then you have to send it to the optical house and get a duplicate made or and processed and then, you know, literally transfer it to uh, tape so you could put it into the edit machine and then it cut it into your show. It was a process like you wouldn't believe it was. And I can't believe they let them do that back then. But that that door closed pretty much in the late 90s when yeah. all the studios were tired of when Paramount was tired of seeing all their Top Gun out trims and outs in in a million b movies yeah. they decided to stop licensing footage from their library as uh you know as a, a way of a business model well that, that's probably a smart thing you know yeah and, yeah uh, i i had footage from air america in one of my movies there was a plane crash uh, uh, an emergency landing sliding down the runway you know that Mel Gibson did with uh, whoever Downey was with him, Jr. Robert Downey Jr. Yeah. yeah, and I used that whole. You're not allowed to use what was in the movie, but you were allowed to use whatever's not in the movie. So oh, okay. all the tr all the trims they had of that sequence of that C-17 plane landing on its belly, there were like multiple angles, and we 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 used, you know, four or five angles of that. cut to our guys in the cockpit the, the the airplane cockpit that was out in sun valley the one from the movie airplane it's like still there today we were using the short ends from deep impact because it was still 35 okay. millimeter you know what short ends are yeah, right yeah, yeah we were using short ends of from deep impact on the tychus shoot so when you'd go to buy your film you know in a low budget house you'd You'd half the money you'd get short ends which were unused film from bigger films instead of throwing it away they'd resell it and they'd say yeah there's about 200 feet in here yeah there's about anyway they'd, they'd come in the deep impact cans <laughs> so literally the, the film cans would show up to be loaded in our camera and it, it's a deep impact on it and and we're I wish I had a photo of that it was pretty that funny is great. yeah is there some Dante's Peak in that too? Yeah, there's tons of Dante's. Any disaster okay. movie you ever oh, made at the moment, time yeah. was stuff was in it, and and would literally you'd go through and go, we got to try and get that, we got to try and get that, and then write a scene around it or something. That's... So again, it was you know by that time I had done the Saban shows, but I had already yeah it it was quite a quite an experience at Royal Oaks. That was some fun fun times as i tell this to andrew i still speak to him today i go i wish i wasn't so serious then but i was i was new and coming up and trying to everything i did was to hopefully help me move to the next level or do something for my career and uh you know it, it's clearly why i went into television you know I, I may not have gone into television so quickly if i wasn't a, already an experienced b movie and be television director. I mean, my skill set was like sharp, and it's you know, it's it's uh, absolutely served me to this day. The the knowing how to get in and out of any situation, any emergency on a movie set, to get the story told without having to come back and reshoot. Wow. And that's that's what you learn when you do those movies. Collision in three, two, one. Dennis Hopper was our star in Tychus, and Dennis Hopper was the only reason the movie got greenlit and funded for the foreign sales. So he's there, and he doesn't want to. He he he's doing it for the money. 
because he was sued by Rip Torn because they got in a fight or something, and he and he lost, and he had to, you know. So that was the story. So he was there for ten days. He was getting three hundred thousand dollars, and he would he and he he was playing the bad guy, and he didn't want to play the bad guy. He wanted to be the good guy. And he didn't want to say any of the lines that were in the script. Shit. So he he says, I'm not saying that, you know, and and like, oh, okay. And I'm a young kid, you know, I don't know what to do. I, I can't say so, well, you gotta say it. So he doesn't say half the words, and I'm like looking at the script trying to figure out how to make this work. Me and the other actors, Pete Onorati and Chick Venera, we were constantly, you know, okay, well, uh, let's just See if over there anyway he would he we'd finish him up pretty quick and send him off to the golf course and then we, after he left we were, had sets in this warehouse we had Peter and uh, Chick and we had all the missing plot line that he didn't want to talk about you know he didn't want to say oh, and they had to deliver all the so we we literally yeah. had to come up with new scenes like on the spot. And have them talk over, you know, what was missed in order to make it make it work. And a lot of the scenes between Peter and Chick in the movie, like there's one on an airplane where they're riding together and they're talking about something, uh, is a, a direct reason that because Hopper left all of the the exposition about his character out. Just keep thinking that everything we need has been placed here for us. That we... That's right. And Peter Crawford took what was given to him and created Archangel. Now, what's wrong with that? Think about it. But once I figured out that he, he didn't want to say a lot of lines and he just wanted to go home quickly, I, I figured it out, like, I don't know, halfway through his 10 days. And I so when I realized it, I looked. I'd look at the script the night before and go. He's not gonna say. He's not gonna want to say this. He's not gonna want to say this. So <clears throat> when he'd arrive, I go, Hey, Dennis, I got. Come over here. I got. I had a great idea. And he'd come over and he'd look at look at my script. I go, This is a terrible line. Let's let's just get rid of this. He goes. He goes. Yeah. That's. I was thinking the same thing. He was so relieved. I go, no, we're going to go right from here. You're going to say that. We're going to go all the way to the bottom of the page, and you're going to pick that up line, and then boom, you're out of there. He goes. Great, You're and his he best thought friend all of a sudden. Yeah, I'm all his best friend all of a sudden. <laughs> so then, and I'd figure out how to give those lines to somebody else, which is and, also uh, good for the other actors that beefs up yes. their parts. You know, yeah. You are now part of the continuum of humanity. Act accordingly. What you learned by fire on on the uh, those times at Andrews movies was that. If you didn't figure out a way to make it work and it wasn't 92 minutes long or whatever it needed to be, you you were dead. And uh, I'd call him uh, all the time and and say he's not saying he won't say his lines. What do I do? And, and all Andrew was saying, Putch, he goes, if there's no Dennis Hopper, there's no movie. So figure it out. <laughs> Have him say something or just have him stand there and nod his head. And, we'll, and you know, I go, well, that's kind of what we're doing. He goes, that's it. That's all. Just keep him there and keep him happy. That's a valuable lesson. Wow. It has nothing to do with the movie, the story, the act, it anything. Does, it's though, about a it human. It's about viewing. a human person and their, where they are in their life and why they're there. And that takes precedent over you know the what you normally would feel is like everybody's there for the the project well well they're not on a b movie they're they're there for the money or for some other reason or they're just starting out so at at, at that young age i can say this now because i i've i've i'm old and i've lived all this but at that young age if someone had said that to me what i just described to you I would probably have just been a wiser, you know, I would not have been so anxious or too serious about it. So, but that's, right, that's life. That's what we learn as we get older. We, we look back and go, wow, if I'd have known that, so.
That's like but, the ultimate challenge. Not only are you crafting something around stock footage, <laughs> but you're almost having to piecemeal the performance out of this guy. You oh, really it was are. a amazing puzzle. Yeah. yeah. The fact it's, that it's um, so completed I, is amazing. Direct, I don't think directors today, at least the ones I run into on television shows, have never gone through what I've gone through. Uh, very few. There's very few guys that have done that, and gals. Because... It's all all that stuff's handled for them by other people, and it's not their responsibility. They're literally there to say action, cut, stage the scene, and you know hobnob with and, you know and get the get the get the story shot. And uh, I'm grateful that I had all this you know training in stem to stern making of a movie where they literally like drop a million three in your lap with stock footage some actor that doesn't want to be there, some movie star, and like 18 days and a low-budget, you know, contract, drop it in your lap and say, this has to be good. Here, go make it. <laughs> make America And, and they don't yeah. do that anymore. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. You have to learn on your own. You know, people make their videos now, and that's how they literally train themselves. But there's no, there's no like, companies that will take the young kid and say here do this it's literally the pedigree now is they pluck you out of the film school or the social media storm that you uh, made a made a, a, a fuss in and they like literally drop you into a machine that will basically make your episode or your film around you no matter whether you know what you're doing or not so mm -hmm. I mean, you gotta, yeah, you gotta give credit to exploitation films and yes. all of that. Like, there's such yes. a breeding ground for talent, and certainly yep. Corman. Yep. Um, but yeah, you're right. There's no, there's no house for that anymore. There's no mm -hmm. studio that's just churning out stuff based off whether or not they got Jen, John Carradine in a performance, and then they make a movie around it. You know, no mm -hmm. AIP, no uh, yeah. New World, New, New Concord, any of that. Yeah, it's really strange. Um, yeah. But I'm really glad, you know, I got to see both. And then when I arrived into telev network television, and, and uh, I realized my skill set, while I offered it constantly early on, was not understood or appreciated or needed. So I stopped solving the problems at, at the production level for them because they, they clearly didn't, that wasn't what they believed a director should be doing. So it's it's a whole different animal television wise. Feature wise I can't I can't imagine it's the same as T V, but but I am like I, again I say I'm grateful I learned the mechanics at the time I came up. So glad because I can do everything and I don't need I don't need to ask anyone else how to do something uh, that's and as evidenced by starting in 2005 with Mojave phone booth and then moving to the Route 30 trilogy and Father and the Bear and everything else in between that I've done so it's it's I'm grateful I can it, there's nothing different in what I do with those bigger polished movies of mine than what I did when I was a kid making Super 8's it's, true. it's the same. You just go out with your buddies or your friends or your wives and your husbands and you shoot a scene somewhere and you end up go home, cut it together and somehow get music to it, fix the sound. Do a, It's just stuff people can do. I'm yeah. glad I know how to do all that. This makes me a better director. So. Well, yeah, you're resourceful, you're self-sufficient. Yeah. I know how it works. If you're, if you're a mechanically apt person and you're a director then you know how editing works because you've edited. You know how the equipment on set works. So that informs you as to how you want to shoot something and what you can and can't do without having to ask or find out after you've already ordered everybody to do something and then it doesn't work. And then you, you're, you're learning on the spot. But if you are if you're know all that stuff, if you're mechanically apt and you're curious about the way things work, I think you become, you know, just a, a far better director than, than, you know, than not, than not knowing that.
Yeah, and I and I uh, all of my friends that don't that enjoy working on stuff and it's not all only about the money that's who you see in my movies so when you decide to in my independent movies when yeah. when you decide to make an independent movie for me why do i want the dennis hopper experience yeah. you know i i want people who want to be there i don't need name value or celebrity value i need good actors who are friends of mine that want to come and do something nice and fun and that's really who's in my movies and you see them over and over again uh because that all they want to do is do it again but then whenever i possibly i can i try to put them in something you know that will pay them like i put uh, you know deluise i got him a couple jobs in things i got bob you know i put bob in the beethoven movie him and curtis were, were okay, the, that's right. Were the were the yeah. two bad guys that Christmas, stole? Yeah, adventure. yeah, the Christmas. Yeah, yeah. So those, you know, so again, I got Curtis in that. That paid him some money. I got him in, you know, the uh, pie movie. You know, because you know he he's let's face it, Bob and Curtis are easy sells to a network or a studio because most that's people the know them. And I literally go, let's get those guys. Let's get C Curtis and you know and Bob as the two funny henchmen I mean, so i like to try to reward them for doing my movies for a hundred dollars and you know and coach airplane tickets by trying to put them in something but um you know now you know once you move into episodic television which is what i've been doing for the last 10 years you really don't they don't want to hear your casting ideas they they literally just you know want you i, I have nothing to do with casting most of the time so you're a Unless hired gun, a really. Hired gun, they don't want to, yeah. you know, nothing. You don't you don't do anything in post. You don't, you know, you edit it, hand it over and then you're you're done. So, I don't get to put them in the half hour shows like I I would normally like to. Uh, because the writers of the show, the head cheeses of these television shows really do all that. And a lot of times they'll have their own agendas or their own tastes that aren't like mine. And so pretty soon you're just, you're down there working with their script, with their cast and, and their crew, and, and you're trying to have a nice time with those people. And that's kind of what you do. It's kind of a prepackaged deal. You just come in and deal with whatever they've already got on the plate. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, it's that's hard for a guy like me. It took me years to get over that, not being in control or at least having a say in the creative side of things because i learned you're when you're a director you're the person that's literally in charge of all the decisions to create this look feel and sound of whatever play you're directing or movie you're making or whatever and when you get to television you're it's not the case at all so it's harder for guys like me to transition in television than it is for people who've never done what I've done prior to jumping into the director's chair and just starting in television. You're the kind I mentioned before that are just plucked out of the social media storm and put in mm -hmm. the director's chair. They don't know any better and they don't know any different. So all they're looking is, like, oh, this is how it's done. I don't, I'm not mm -hmm. casting. I'm not deciding where the music goes. I'm not, you know, I'm not yeah. deciding where the, co what color the shirt is. So I believe it's easier for someone like that. Ignorance is bliss. It really it is. is. But the, yeah, that's not that's not a good training ground, really. If you go into it with that perspective, I mean, yeah, but you can have a it's... schizophrenic approach to it. You can do it direct <laughs> this way or direct their way, and that's also a talent. Like you said, you honed it. You figured it out. You know, you just need to walk yeah. in as a different person. Like so, how many people can do that? Not many. I, if you have, yeah, I know. I enjoy talking with you. I appreciate how generous you've been and, and you've been super cool and supportive <laughs> and you don't, I mean, you didn't know me when I reached out to you and on Facebook and you're like, yeah, what the hell? Why not? Yeah. That, Cause that I'm a regular guy. Episode, everybody loves that interview episode. That's the that was a good rating one. episode. By the was way. it? Which is not saying much. We don't get a lot of followers, but well, I put a link on my website of it, and uh, okay. I, yeah, no, oh, it's yeah. up there, and uh, 
everyone who's listened to it that I've sent it to said it was very entertaining. And in fact, the two guys, uh, Will and Carl, Will Love and Carl Schur, the two gay men okay. that ran Totem Pole that are in Father and the Bear um, and the other movies, I, I've known them all my freaking life, okay? And they said to me, that was really interesting. I didn't realize you'd done so much. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. That's what they said. And it's these so guys, have, I've known them all my life. These All right. Yeah. All Nathan, right. see you later, buddy. Take care, brother. You look good. I like the hair slicked back, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> you too, brother. Thank you. Okay, bye. All right, bye. <laughs>